Um, I wonder if I could invite everybody to uh, return to the table and to the conference room. See, David has the enviable role of getting the benefit of releasing you. <laughs> and and I, I get to, to receive all your ire for calling you back. But I know that a lot of what's been going on is a lot of interesting conversations about the topic as well, which is also Fol useful. Folks, don't, don't make George feel bad. <laughs> Please resume your seats. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's 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 yeah right exactly. Let's get rolling here. If, well, or rocking and rolling, um, so that we can uh, begin. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with five quick polling questions. These are the last five polling questions of the day, they all pertain to the issue of politics. What is the biggest concern going into the 2015 election in Nigeria? One. Increasing violence in northern Nigeria. Two, attacks by Boko Haram. Three, tensions between the north and the south. Four, lack of confidence in the legitimacy of the electoral process. Or five, other. And despite the absence of the people who are out there still chatting, we're voting. 74% of you say lack of confidence in the legitimacy of the electoral process. That's impressive. All right. Um, next. Agree or disagree, underlying political tensions will le yield popular discontent regardless of the outcome of elections. This is a range question between strongly disagree and strongly agree. Not, that's not it. That's the next question. Oh, there you go. Wow, 84% of you agree or strongly agree that the election will still yield political tensions regardless of what the outcome is. Not terribly optimistic, but telling. Next, is a political solution contingent on structural reform of the Nigerian military? Well, that hasn't come up, but take a shot at it. Yes, no, or unsure? You always vote unsure? Is that what you just said? <laughs> wow. wow. There, that's a beautiful answer. <laughs> when I, we learned absolutely nothing from that question. <laughs> All right, let's take one more. What is the single most important challenge facing Nigeria's political system? Is it tension between the North and South, widespread corruption, lack of faith in public leaders to act in the interests of Nigeria as a whole, an entrenched political elite, or which could be those are similar, or other? Fifty-eight percent of you say lack of faith in public leaders to act in the interests of Nigeria as a whole. Nineteen percent say an entrenched political elite, which is a cousin of that. Right? So that's uh, seventy-seven percent of you sort of in the same neighborhood. Is that the last question? One more question. And the last question is, what is the most effective tool the international community has to push for political reform in Nigeria? Is it direct pressure on the Nigerian government? Support for opposition political party development, policy-based loans from the international financial institutions, 
pressure from international business interests in southern Nigeria or other? What is the most effective tool? If we get a big enough number on this, we can go home right now. Okay, 43% of you say direct pressure on the Nigerian government. Of course, we have to figure out who's going to place that pressure on the Nigerian government. 17% say other. Who said, yeah, who said other? You, you said other? Okay. Well, it is oh. the U.S. Institute of Peace, after all. We have a different perspective on things. And, and, I, and the other really is um, uh, trying to find more effective ways to play and work with other elements in, who occupy this space. Uh, because all of these others are uh, contingent upon uh, somehow uh, getting the Nigerian government to do something. And so, so you're saying local governments, local, governments, local NGOs, NGOs, civil society organizations, churches, churches, I mean, churches religious right. groups, you name it. That's, uh, that's where it goes. Okay, who else said other up here among you insurgents? Yes, Jim. And I'm stealing some of my thunder from later, but personal relationships at the leadership level can do a lot in this world, particularly if you've faced with, uh, and that was my other answer to an earlier question, what's the biggest problem facing Nigeria? I picked other because you didn't have Boko Haram because I thought the, every country in Africa has the other five or other four, whereas Boko Haram is a special one. If that really is a real problem, and it seems to be in that country, then uh, if we can help the leader of that country succeed, uh, we have we being the United States, are the international community, uh, pressure and a, a leverage point on him that otherwise you don't have. Excellent. Okay, jo Johnny. Support for a vast array of non-governmental organizations uh, that can, in fact, uh, impact uh, their government uh, more directly uh, and with less harm than ourselves. So George is saying that's what I said. Yeah, well, you know, okay, so but that's, that's, <laughs> that's what he said. Uh, okay, was there anybody else? Okay, um, you can tell what a zany crowd we have here. But, um, it, you know, the, uh, by, by the way, I do want you to know that um, you're all trending on Twitter in Washington, D.C. We're the third uh, of the items on Twitter at the moment behind those noting on Twitter the one-year anniversary of the death of Nelson Mandela and a series of tweets having to do with the death of the New Republic. We're right behind the death of the New Republic. Um, <laughs> which I, I mean, the, why that is trending on Twitter, I think it says more about the nature of Twitter, frankly, <laughs> than it does about the broad interests of people. Um, in any event, uh, I just want you to know, there you are, right in the center of the center of the consciousness of Washington, D.C.'s Twitterati. Uh, okay, um, so let us turn to uh, the first, uh, or the scene setting slides for the scenario, uh, exploring the political drivers of radicalization and extremism. And let's take a look at the first of these slides just to set the stage. So Boko Haram's roots lie in political corruption and dysfunction as we have discussed the extremist group wrote out as of dissatisfaction with Nigeria's corrupt political system, offering Sharia law as an alternative. We've heard some other interpretations of that. Uh, the focus on the forbidding of Western education was rooted in not only the interpretation of Islam, but also the view that the Nigeria's colonialist-based education system uh, perpetuated a corrupt political system. Uh, we've talked about how it moved from uh, the, the, the apparent focus on Sharia into a violent group, uh, although we've also talked about how elements of it um, uh, have differing agendas, some <laughs> criminal, some political, uh, some perhaps ideological. Next. Um, Boko Haram is central to the political debate in Nigeria. Since the contentious presidential election in 2011, the North and South have traded accusations over which side has been directly and indirectly aiding the extremist group. Um, uh, following the, the, uh, the election, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the northern politicians have accused the southern politicians of aiding and supporting Boko Haram as a means of destabilizing the north and maintaining their grip. Uh, southern groups have accused northern politicians of actively supporting the group 
as a means of undermining the national government's attempts to control the outbreak of violence. Um, Boko Haram violence has deepened the animosity and racial uh, and, and uh, uh, divide within the, the, the country. As I, as I was reading it, I was sort of thinking, this also sounds a little bit like when we talk about Syria, how different groups, different extremist groups are embraced by both sides to advance their causes because they enable them to make their case somewhat better. Next, uh, Boko Haram activities complicate the February 2015 elections. Uh, Nigeria is going forward with elections in three months that are likely to exacerbate many of the country's underlying tensions. Uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, who is from the southern Niger Delta region, is running for re-election. Um, a number of critical tensions will be brought to bear, including ethnic and religious tensions, north-south tensions. Uh, the security situation is clearly uh, uneasy. There is potential for violence. Uh, the election is top to bottom. It is, a, it is a big deal, as we have talked about in the course of this discussion. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, and beyond that to the move itself, where do we start? We, we, we know the moves are fictional. We'll keep going from there. Um, as violence grows in the north, the government calls on the international community to support peaceful elections. That sounds consistent with our friends in the Nigerian government over here in this corner, at any rate. Um, uh, uh, here we have uh, Kim, the BBC News North Africa, Africa feed saying, in response to Boko Haram's increasing presence in northern Nigeria and growing violence ahead of the 2015 elections, Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan has called on international actors to help develop and support strategies for fostering peaceful elections. The president has extended an invitation uh, to members of an international community to participate in developing ideas. Okay, he's not actually done that. That's our scenario. I just want you to be clear about that. And if you think that, you know, scenario sort of reflects this group around the table, that's right. Okay, the idea here is that we are going to have a little bit of a discussion about what the various players around the table can actually do before the election to help ensure the best possible outcome in the election. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's what you think is possible, but also let's be a little creative about what might be constructive and uh, think about developing strategies for ensuring an inclusive, peaceful February 2015 election. Talk among yourselves for five minutes and then we will begin our conversation. Most of it's Indian. What are the things you're doing for hand people from coming out of the vote? What about intimidation? Is there a sense in which Boko Haram will tell people that they shouldn't vote because these are illegitimate? What about the sort of distance to polling places? Is that also an issue? The head of INEC has called for to increase from 120,000 polling places to 150. Mm -hmm. That's been now pulled back, but that extra 30,000 was to account for the vast okay. area of distribution. And why was it pulled back? Because it seems favoring the north? It seems favoring the north, but it, it really meant that northerners could get to the polls. Uh -huh. So isn't that one thing that we would... We could call for that. Sometimes you just need to reiterate the increased number of polling places. I don't think security. they will. I don't think it's over. Um, people will see what they do. Uh, will threaten people not to go. I think they'll. Yeah, they will have that in the four key areas, uh, and maybe not even in the areas that you would expect. You would expect Abuja to be there. It's easy. It's easy to get a school. Would they attack the party? So you need better protection. There was like, yeah, there will. What is Yeah. Well, yeah, it could be. I don't want to get into conspiracy. So you just need better protection for a candidate to cross the border. Well, if 
If local religious and other leaders call for people to vote, would they listen? Yes. It wouldn't hurt. Well, and if they do call for people to vote, then they'll be at risk from yeah. elements of Boko Haram. So. Just for security. Mm. Well, always that. Well, the, the more obvious thing is that uh, yeah, you're right. yeah. certain yeah. political figures are well, targeted by these yeah. things. Yeah. 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 Just the, mm. the voting in the school schoolyard. Yeah. 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 Mm. Plus some IEDs and then, of course, the dead. What about providing, yeah. is it feasible to provide okay. transportation yeah. to the polling places? Yeah. And the, and the legal issues that we talked about from to put it off. We're going to start in two minutes. Okay, let us uh, dive in here. Okay, so violence is growing in the north, and we are pulling together a group of people to talk about what can be done to produce peaceful, ideally of successful elections. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin with some examples from uh, the playbook of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, you, you have some recent experience in this regard. Well, well, thanks, David. We do in indeed. I mean, as many, most of you know around the table, this is not um, an unrealistic proposition to devise strategies for reducing the tensions uh, and the potential for violence around elections. I'm sitting here looking at John Temin, who was successful as not so much in the election context, but in the referendum context in, South, in Sudan, where there was enormous potential for, for violence, but where we were able to devise, with a lot of others' help, strategies that reduced that. Uh, we have the example, important example, well, I'm looking at Princeton Lyman uh, uh, in terms of what happened in South Africa, because there are two enormous concerns about the potential for violence in those elections and an enormous amount of the effort that went into um, to, uh, addressing the likely uh, um, triggers of violence during the election campaign, and most recently, Afghanistan, where USIP was called upon to try to ensure a peaceful election. Uh, this doesn't speak to the outcome of the election, 
but at least to the extent that having a peaceful election removes some of the sources of tension and grievance that can contribute there to post-electoral violence, it was a success. So, Nigerian NGOs, you're there, you're on the ground, the government has called for this, they have their own interests in it, so I'm not going to turn to them first. Uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to know what do you think are one, two, or three important metrics for, you know, uh, or goals uh, with regard to the election that, you know, need to be addressed? Uh, we have two suggestions. Lean forward to the microphone. I'm sorry. We have two suggestions. One is um, addressing the question of transparency and release of the voter uh, outcomes. The INEC only releases the results of the polls down to the local government level, but not down to the precinct level. So when international observers go, and I've been to the last four elections, you have your data as what you saw with your two eyes. But when the voting results come, you do have no way of knowing whether those results were in fact counted in that way. INEC refuses to re release those numbers, and it's, it, it creates all kinds of uh, grounds for uh, uh, controversy, and it would be a very simple thing to do. Release all the numbers of the votes down to the voting booth level. That's, that's number how one. Do you, how do you, what do you think is the lever by which that can be achieved? I think the United States government could tell them that they would reduce violence and, 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 and increase the credibility of the results. And it would so, be so easy to do. And it would decrease the opportunity for man, manipulation, which occurs after the votes in the enumeration process. They don't stuff ballot boxes as much anymore. They do it behind the scenes. By, and it goes through the counting, goes through th three or four layers. And at each layer, they can manipulate those votes. And that, so we need more transparency. It's a, it's a technical uh, solution that can add a lot to reducing violence and increasing the credibility of the election. I'm going to come back to you in a second, but I want to, you, you talk about reaching out to the United States government to do that. It strikes me that one of the interesting things about that, I mean, it seems practical, it seems like a creative way to address this. One of the interesting things about it is one presumably could approach the Nigerians privately about it, but you always have the ability to play the card that you will say that you publicly that you're suggesting this, and then if they resist it, then it has, puts pressure on them. Is it something you think you as the U.S. government would do in this circumstance? I would defer to some ambassadors in the room who may have seen this play out in, in, in real terms. Um, but the other opportunity is for a high-level delegation to be appointed um, that would go and observe these elections. My, my former boss, Michael, and Michael Phelan, and my former boss, Dick Luger, did this a couple of times in a couple of elections around the world. Um, as I'm sure Mr. Okay, Shea did as well. A, that's a different issue. I want to specifically but, but on build this issue. on that. Specifically on this issue. Any of the ambassadors he was referring to want to comment on whether you think the United States uh, would, could push that issue? I'm, I'm looking at you, but, you know. You're, <laughs> you're, you're looking at me. Uh, there, there are current representatives of the executive branch here, so I don't want to speak for, for them. Uh, but uh, all of those uh, who are familiar with the, the uh, 2011 uh, elections uh, know that uh, we pushed enormously hard for the former uh, election uh, commissioner, uh, Maurice uh, Iwu, who had been known for uh, carrying out some of the worst elections uh, in Africa uh, from being uh, renewed as election commissioner. Uh, and uh, we pushed very, very hard for uh, a new election commissioner. Uh, one was appointed, uh, and that was uh, Professor uh, Jacob. Uh, we also pushed uh, uh, for other uh, kinds of uh, electoral uh, reforms uh, with, uh, with, the, with the government, uh, some of uh, which uh, were implemented and some of which weren't. Uh, so there is uh, the possibility uh, of being able to do things. We, uh, again, in, in, in uh, 2011, uh, provided through USAID and its partners uh, a great deal of uh, support uh, to, uh, to the election commission uh, 
uh, and uh, <coughs> some of that uh, support uh, might have been withdrawn uh, if there had not been substantial changes and improvements made uh, from what had been a series of very, and I think people like Chris Vermunio and Pauline Baker know this, a series of very uh, terrible elections before 20, uh, 2011. So but our presence is, is important. I, I, I was at the but elections I, myself uh, and out several times. Sir, I think, I think you, do, you, you probably do go private and give, it, give them the chance, give good luck uh, Johnny down there, the chance to, to make it his idea. Um, and say that it's going to improve the credibility of your re-election. Okay, um, well, I, and I think what I take away... if he says no, then you go... What I uh, take away from that is it's an interesting idea. It might have an effect. Um, it's something that we might put on a list of ideas that could come out of this and that the United States has in the past uh, uh, exerted some pressure and had some positive results, so it's not a, something that's out of the question. Your next thing was... The next thing was... Um, the creation, this, this actually borrows from things that have been done in South Africa and Kenya, is to create a team, and in the Nigerian case, this would be a mixed team that would comprise representatives of civil society, um, the security services, INIC, um, to be kind of intervention uh, teams when there's early, there are plenty of groups now doing early warning, tracking violence, etc. But when you see that there's a hot spot and there's a capacity for violence to send in these teams to mediate and respond right away. Um, it seems to me that, it, that this was done in Kenya after the violence in the election. And in South Africa, it had, when, when, the, when the turmoil in the townships were going on, civil society organized such intervention teams. Um, so there's a lot of mapping going on of violence trends. Uh, uh, civil society groups are now thinking of, okay, what do we do in terms of intervention? And I think the United States could help finance that. Uh, some corporations could help finance that. And, and in theory, the international community of the United Nations might That's be right. supportive of right. that. That's right. Would, would you? Yes. Yeah, the United Nations would. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a positive thing. Yeah. Yes. Another thing civil society could do would be to generate public discussion about the situation in the three northeastern states. Can elections be held there? under what circumstances, what to do with IDPs, what happens if they're not held there and the 25% requirement in three quarters of the states is not met. Does that mean three quarters of the states where elections were held or three quarters of the states overall? There are a lot of issues around when that. When you say a public discussion though, what do you mean? Town hall meetings, television shows? And promote discussion in the press. In yeah. the pre just, just raise awareness of the issue, Sarah. So, coming from the perspective of a large telecom corporation, is we, that what you've become here? We have become <laughs> yeah, large telecom. Um, yeah. <laughs> we we were trying to think creatively. Le lean into the mic. Um, trying to think creatively of how we might be able to positively influence this process, and we were surprised that we weren't approached by any NGOs um, as potential partners, but. Um, we would be more NGOs, than willing. NGOs, they talk a good game, but they're <laughs> allergic to companies. We would speaking. be more than willing to um, work on peace messages that could go out to all of our cell phone customers gr um, gratis. Um, we would also um, be willing to try to help disseminate polling information. So, you know, for instance, text vote to a number, and then you, you get information about where you. Um, are meant to go vote, and also to work with the, the already existing work on um, violence prevention and um, fraud reporting, you know, the crowdsourcing platforms to use free SMS messages to, to, to send that information into some type of central portal. And also, you know, because rumor can be dangerous, if, if, if it's not possible to have INEC in, um, you know, involved in this and, you know, releasing official numbers, could we not work with international NGOs and local NGOs that are doing parallel vote tabulation, get those numbers out to people so that, you know, we can help tamp down some of those rumors where people are wondering what the election results are? Wait, th these are all very good suggestions. It's a lot easier on the political side than the economic side, mm -hmm. apparently. Um, you've had already two I suggestions. Okay, go on. <laughs> There's a lot of displaced persons in the three affected northeastern states that are not going to be in their towns to vote and uh, also raise the credibility of those elections. 
there ought to be some thought given to how to register and allow these groups to vote uh, in their displaced population so they're not disenfranchised. Okay, good. Kim. Uh, picking up on what um, the NGOs were saying as well and, and some of what you were saying, uh, we are inviting uh, the two main candidates, if, if there are going to be two, uh, at the moment it does appear, so we're inviting the two main candidates uh, to participate in a live televised uh, debate organized by the BBC and the local, uh, with local partners to um, discuss and debate the issues, help voters feel more connected and involved, and also help bridge the disconnect that people in countries like Nigeria feel uh, with, their, with their leaders. How many people listen to your Hausa service? I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, it's a very popular service. So between Hausa, between BBC Hausa, between VOA, local, um, local media, and BBC World Television, we have a very big, uh, very big reach. But I, I, sh I should say that before I managed to organize this debate, I would probably get fired for writing copy, uh, <laughs> that, for writing this copy, because it reads too much like a think tank report and not enough like a news report. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do worse than that, Deirdre. Um, local Nigeria business interests uh, have many of the same opportunities for funding, uh, parallel voting, uh, transparency in the um, monitoring process, uh, posting results. They can fund local NGOs, and we have been approached uh, in a very local way by NGOs asking us also for logistical support uh, in movement of people who could do this monitoring from place to place, also uh, providing communication equipment. And we've also been asked by local NGOs for uh, funding for uh, voter education and preparation for the election, uh, messages about peace and peaceful elections, uh, PSA announcements, and our uh, chambers of commerce are going to issue statements about their expectations of a peaceful, uh, free, and fair election. So, did you want to say something? This is sounding like a wonderful election result. I'm extremely <laughs> excited about this. Did you want to say something, Kate? Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say that the international NGOs have spent a lot of time coordinating with the Nigerian NGOs to support uh, efforts on uh, uh, vote monitoring and tabulation and uh, civic uh, education programs. So we're delighted to take money from the multinational corporations and the media uh, to support uh, 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 social a, messaging. You're in a good position. You take yes. money from them and you take credit for what they've been that's, doing. That's right. Uh, yeah. and, and we offer technical <laughs> assistance. Uh, the, the other point the international NGOs would like to raise is the, the need to uh, sensitize and train uh, Nigerians security services to remain impartial and neutral uh, in their role in um, uh, uh, constraining and uh, mitigating against violence around the elections. Okay. The European Union says? <coughs> well, the European Union uh, <coughs> has in the past and would support all of the types of activities that we've uh, heard about and does uh, also. But we have to face the fact, uh, if I can throw some cold water on this, that the likelihood of a free and fair election in 2015 is very low. <laughs> uh, the PDP is the best organized, but that doesn't mean that they won't want to pad whatever majority they can get. And the, and the, and the North, which has yet to pick a, uh, APC has yet to pick a candidate, and there'll be some dissension from that. We, whoever wins, there's going to be violence and there's going to be dissension. The, were you worried we, that we were having too positive a yes, conversation? I think you're having much too positive a conversation because the real question then is, with all our efforts, are we per, per, perpetuating an illusion okay. that we can influence this situation to have a free and fair and credible election? And then the question is, what, what's our alternative? I knew this was going to go off the tracks um, one, way or, one way or another. Chris. I think... Um, we should acknowledge the fact that the drivers of election violence in Nigeria or election rigging in Nigeria are domestic and tend to be the partisan political elites. Uh, that's an obvious. They are the ones that pull the strings from, from behind the scenes. And while NGOs, both international and domestic, can facilitate 
the process of conducting a peaceful election, uh, sometimes they act on the margins. So what I would suggest is to take the media's suggestion one step further and say that let's constitute an international team that can work with the African Union and impress upon the two major candidates, once they're known, to make a public commitment before all Nigerians and the rest of the world that they would abide by the outcome and that they would contribute personally and through their political parties to the conduct of peaceful elections. I think that kind of public commitment from the two major candidates would have a huge impact on the conduct of their partisans. And then on the issue of the IDPs, the internally displaced persons, I think that should be easy to resolve for the presidential race, because for the presidential race, the entire country is one constituency. So it really shouldn't matter where a Nigerian votes as long as he or she is within the borders of the country. Um, there may be need for a quick amendment of the Electoral Act to make that possible so that these internally displaced persons can vote wherever they are within Nigerian territory. Uh, as neighboring countries, we, we thought a little bit about the fate of refugees, and ideally we would want them included into the electoral process so they don't feel excluded, uh, because that can begin the national reconciliation and healing process. But we agree that the logistics may be too challenging, um, and also we didn't want to catch the wrath of Boko Haram uh, if we're suddenly organizing election-related activities in our respective countries. Okay, well, I'm deliberately leaving them to the end, and I'm, I'm going to leave you guys to the end, but I'm going to change the game here. Ahmed, we haven't even spoken, but hello. Um, and you're here in the Nigerian government, but I'm going to break you off of the Nigerian government. In fact, I'm going to break both of you off. You guys are now the opposition. Okay, you are the Nigerian government. You are now the opposition, because I'd like to hear, if we have an election, two sets of voices here. Now, we can have a private discussion because we're all friends, right? And you're hearing all of this stuff about open, free, fair, funded, visible, transparent, the world is getting together. This is looking like a great election. How do you feel, but this is us personally. How do you feel about a big transparent election in the North? where you know everybody really does get a chance to vote is that a good thing from your perspective mr president thank you very much private this is a private conversation private. Now we're, i want to know what's inside your head i want to know what you really think we want the best election no 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 what does he really think does he want a free and fair election in the north He told me off he told me off report that he didn't care. He would actually, if that's against him, he would yeah, prefer yeah, it not yeah. to be free. Could, we, could we ask the question differently? It would just be, just as a point of information, if it was a fair election, who would win? And if the incumbent would win, wouldn't it in fact be to their advantage to then have people oversee it? Okay, let's ask it that way. If it were a fair election, would the incumbent win? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a good <laughs> okay, if we were a fair election, would the incumbent win? Uh, I have my doubts. You have your doubts. But 2011 was judged to be the, the fairest election uh, since 99, and it was probably the same two candidates, and Jonathan won. That's true, but the price of oil will be what in February? 90. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're actually abusing some other substance. Um, <laughs> David. Uh, I also wanted to sort of emphasize, you know, it's a numbers game. So we have 130,000 polling booths in the country. And we have a little over 300,000 police officers. You can do the math. So, you know, we, that's why we were being proactive in calling for the international community, but really reaching out because we need more than just, as the U.S., with all due respect, 36 people that they're going to send. We need uh, actually an influx of observers. Um, all around the country. So you really believe that a free and fair election is in the interests of the party in power? Absolutely, it's a, a reputational risk. N right, oh, okay, I just wanna make, make sure that y y you do. Is that the private view or the public view? Seriously. Is, it again? It, is that a private view or a public view? In other words, in actual fact, who would win the election? Well, let me turn it back to you. In the US, 
right? If you had a Republican Party in power in the presidency, would they want high turnout in urban areas? No. Like North Carolina? No, they would not want it. Right. So then you can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so you, your answer is they would lose. Want high turnout where you have the most supporters. Right. So it's actually in the interests of the regime to have less turnout in the North. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Okay, I just, we have to get honest about this. How do you guys feel about this move towards freer, fairer elections with all these initiatives? So, on the one hand, we don't believe in the elections anyway, so we want to be as disruptive as possible in uh, various areas and to really undermine the government as much as we can and undermine the elections. But on the other hand, there are parts of our organization that, or those who aid and abet our organization who are committed to having some northern um, opposition wins. And so there's a little bit of conflict within the Boko Haram organization. I think you're going to see attacks on, on some places where we feel really confident that there's there, the only thing we have to do in that area is sow discord. And then you're going to see some real pullback in other areas where you know, we like the Senate candidate or we like the, the local representative uh, from the APC. They've been bankrolling us. We have ties to them. And, and those are going to be peaceful places. And so I think there's going to be a real disparity. Um, but for example, the in the extreme northeastern regions, Ex more violence. Uh, more violence to the places where it makes sense for us. OK. Can we switch to the next slide? I don't want to leave the witness, but let's go to the next slide. Um, so in the extreme north region, <laughs> northeastern regions, um, elections are now going to be suspended. Okay, that's the next move in this discussion. Okay, um, conditions have deteriorated rapidly in Yobe, Borno, and Adamo, Adamo estates, and violence is increasing. In the upcoming presidential elections, the safety of poll workers and citizens can no longer be guaranteed. The current situation is not conducive to a free and fair election, and as a result, voting will not take place in these states. This is an announcement from the government. Okay, this is, this is their assertion. Um, and uh, uh, we want to explore local and international responses to the announcement, as well as potential measures to promote its reversal. Okay, so the violence took a toll, and it was a decision of those in the government, for whatever reasons you may conclude, um, to suspend voting in those states. It raises some of the issues discussed before, you have five minutes to talk about this among yourselves. We will resume at five minutes of three, so five minutes, please. That's number one. Number two, uh, the opposition, rather than boycotting the elections, I don't think uh, they can do they can do much. So do you think they would boycott the elections? It is it is possible. I mean, if 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 they cancel, if in the midst of the if before the elections they review the spirit situation and they invite all the parties round table with INEC to say, look, we cannot hold elections in A, B, C because of insecurity. Okay, what will happen? What, what, mm. as, northern, as northern leaders, mm. what are you going to do about this? Are you going to try to get them to reverse is, is, it? is it a party issue or is it a...
All right, we'll begin in one minute. So if you'd take your seats, we're going to begin again in one minute. Okay, so Nigerian government, current regime, why'd you do this? Why did you, why did you take this action? Well, first, despite uh, some views to the contrary, it was actually the Independent National Electoral Commission that decided uh, that the elections couldn't be administered safely in those three states. Uh, government supports that decision. Uh, we think uh, uh, that it was a decision uh, made in the best interest of the citizens of, of that area. Many of the local government areas, unfortunately, are held by terrorists, and they wouldn't let uh, democracy flourish in that region. Um, we tried to speak to the opposition party about uh, coming up with a, a plan to look to the future and, and maybe see how we could work with INEC together and uh, uh, maybe stagger the elections, uh, hold them uh, at a time in the future when we can move more security forces there or after uh, our military takes control of that population back from the terrorists just a few months from now. Yeah. I should add that we got very weak response to the call to get international observers. So as a follow-up, we just don't have enough people to be intervene in that area to provide the kind of safety for people. And at the end of the day, that's the main thing. Well, it's safety is above all, yes. And um, in the opposition, how do you feel about this decision? You're the other candidate in the- Well, we, we have, uh, we, 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 we have, uh, call on the international community and also we don't, we don't trust Nigerian government in delivering free and fair election. And uh, if you can observe, the Northeast is, uh, is predominantly opposition. So this is the way to, you know, uh, disenfranchise and uh, the opposition. So we don't believe, I mean, it's a failure of leadership in the first place for not, I mean, the, 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 the federal government is in charge of the security and they have failed to secure the, the area and uh, they have failed in, in, in governance. Will you condemn the decision? To, in, in totality, yeah. you know, because this is our territory. Okay, and so the media is covering this story, uh, which they're doing busily because they're all on their iPad. Our, iPad. our televised, uh, our, our, our televised no, debate. We're tweeting. We're tweeting. They're live tweeting. We're, we're actually crowdsourcing locally based uh, reporters, uh, citizen reporters in these in these northeastern states uh, to report. Uh, Don't on tell the anybody. Don't tell anybody my response to this. I know. Like I know you lot. love Twitter. That sounds uh, like David. a lot of bullshit to me. Anyway, but um, okay, okay. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me actually tell you something. In the Kenyan elections and the vi and the violence that occurred there, they went back and they analyzed and the statistical regression on the tweets to see where there was oh a mobilization of activity, and they've now correlated that with violence. And there's a guy named Patrick Meyer who's okay, based okay. in Washington D.C. and he specifically looks at how to determine from social media, the emergence of politically based violence during elections, and I will you send realize, you the report. No, no, but seriously, do you realize you just came up with all that stuff to defend yourself for sending an email to your... No, actually, I've been, I've been thinking about that. I was reading one of your articles, David. Oh, yeah. <laughs> your exchange with Michael Oren, it's very fascinating. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Um, how do you... How do you cover that story? What is, what, is, what, what is the headline that comes out of what's just happened here? The, um, well, the televised debate is, is obviously, um, have, has been shelved uh, for, uh, for now. Um, I, 
j just going back to something you said earlier, or you, you asked earlier about the nine, the, uh, the the viewership and the the, the audience uh, in in for the Hausa service. It's just to detail. It's 19 million uh, just for for the BBC, and there's a television service um, as well. Um, I, I want to. If, if, can I step out of, of my media head just just for a, just for a second? Um, I think it's for important. Just, a second, yes. just for a second. I think it's important when the media does cover uh, stories like this that we also think about the responsibility we have to make sure, whether we're local media or international media, that it doesn't add fire, uh, doesn't add fuel to to the fire. I think that too often. Um, we, we forget about the consequences of our own stories and, and our own headlines. Okay. It's really the same old story, you know, from, from, from Kenya, and it's the same old bad Africa story, and that's the way it's going to be, be covered. You know, democracy undermined, a uh, corrupt leader tries to hold, hold on, and extremist Islam bound to uh, um, move forward as a result. Uh, well, how does extremist Islam, how does Boko Haram respond to this move? Uh, oh, the newest member of Boko Haram here. <laughs> Reinforcements have arrived. Um, We're on a roll. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, the people committed to the Prophet's teachings for propagation and jihad, to you infidels, sometimes called Boko Haram, um, we had declared victory. It seems as if uh, the, the uh, Nigerian government has finally agreed that we are in control of these states and they are now part of the caliphate. And so we are uh, very pleased that they finally have given up their remit in this area um, and given sovereignty to us uh, as, as, as much as we can. And any opposition in these areas or anybody who, uh, who, who opposes us in any way or opposes our interpretation of Sharia in these areas will be dealt with uh, ruthlessly as prescribed by, by Does Sharia. it change your behavior in these regions? So in these regions, uh, no, in, in, we'll carry on anybody who opposes us, any mosques, uh, in, any masjids or anybody who who doesn't preach our version of Islam or Sharia is, is going to be a uh, target. Any uh, infidels are going to be targets. So we're going to carry on in this area. And another, another thing, though, and this is privately, we're not saying this in our, in our PR speech, but uh, we will not protest if certain of our units want to moonlight uh, on behalf of maybe the APC to disrupt elections in the Middle Belt, for instance. We, we, we won't protest. We're not necessarily making a pact or anything, but. Yeah, we'll let them do something else if they want to be paid to disrupt uh, elections where, where they are actually occurring. So you're not exactly disappointed in this no, We're having a party. Well, <laughs> without any alcohol or, or anything else. But not much of a party, no music, no alcohol, but we'll have a party. <laughs> and, and what is the meaningless communique issued by the African Union on this? <laughs> How to respond to that? You know, the African Union does have extensive experience in election observation and would actually have something to say. I think the African Union can call upon its resources, um, in all seriousness, to work with to work with the other observation missions. And the African Union calls upon everybody uh, who has uh, to to follow what Pauline recommended to provide some transparency. Um, with the break off, we don't have a legal position. The Union, the African Union, has been much tougher on. Uh, countries that have had coups and expelling them from the from the organization, but uh, there isn't yet a legal precedent for elections that have been okay. disrupted. Okay, perfect. I, I want to go to you folks. The, the government's just sort of thrown you under the bus here, and and just sort of said, you know, we're, we'll get to you later. How do you feel about that? How do you respond? Well, on behalf of northern government leaders, we feel the future of Nigeria is at stake. The North has always been pro-unity. Uh, the uh, importance of this election uh, is, uh, could not be clearer. Uh, and we are also aware that the three states in question up here, the SOE states, are all predominantly opposition party states with a thin veneer uh, in Adamawa. And according to earlier rumors, Kano has been put under a state of emergency as well. So you've mar marginalized the four opposition states. Uh, obviously, our APC governors in the north don't like this. The PDP governors in the north think this is a great idea. Uh, so at this point, there is a kind of a split. Further, on the observers, we uh, are aware that the government is thinking about denying uh, visas to the EU and the US uh, de observation delegations and uh, wanting to the African Union and the Commonwealth to, to take full responsibility for the, uh, for the monitoring. 
Uh, we do feel very strongly that elections should not be militarized, despite our earlier position on the need for security. Over-militarization will, will depress uh, Northern voting. Uh, we, we, we know that. Uh, there is... Uh, so will not having the election, by the way. There, <laughs> we totally reject the Boko Haram uh, offer of, uh, of help to our, to our, our Kano party, or our APC party. We would, like to, uh, we would like the international community to explore the rumors uh, that the state security services have already got the results of the election and through methods and sources, could you tell us whether this is true or not? Basically, bottom line, we anticipate as a way of saving the country once more a government of national unity, not including the two primary candidates. So they, <laughs> so they're against both of you. Um, you're in the neighboring countries. It looks a little bit like the situation is deteriorating in a way that could produce more refugees, more pressure on you. At, at any point, do you think you turn to the international community? Does, I mean, what do, you, what do you do in this circumstance? Well, uh, first of all, we condemn this move in the strongest possible terms. Uh, in our view, it's a basically a statement of defeat and surrender. Uh, so we'll speak out uh, publicly and privately to the government in Nigeria to try to convince them to reverse this decision. And we will work with uh, ECOWAS, the AU, the UN, and other international bodies to try to have a concerted, united front in our arguing this issue with the government in Nigeria. Uh, it's, this is, if it uh, stands, this could well affect the outcome of the election, and I think it makes it even more important that some sort of uh, mechanism be found that would allow IDPs to vote wherever they may be in Nigeria. Okay, so we've, we've set the stage. We sort of know where the players are here. This is where the creativity comes in, because the goal here is to um, explore potential measures to promote the reversal of this decision. Now, the government made the decision. <laughs> Um, the opposition opposes it, but is in no position to reverse it. Let's turn to the United Nations first. What can be done? We, we need to be creative here. What can be done to reverse this? So um, we, the Secretary General plans to go and have a conversation with uh, President Jonathan um, to ask President Jonathan to reconsider this course of action um, and instead avail itself of the resources available um, in the United Nations and as a member of the Security Council, um, come to the UN and ask for uh, the UN to establish a temporary Chapter 6 resolution uh, for a Blue Helmet force to provide election security, route security, and security of key, uh, key potential polling stations. There wouldn't be multiple polling stations, but there would at least be some polling stations in the north so that people could um, come and would not be disenfranchised. And then also to uh, seek other options, uh, potentially technical options, or work with the, uh, have the UN assist Nigeria in working with the neighboring countries to facilitate voting in, in safe zones in, in their countries. Um, we will also encourage um, uh, President Jonathan uh, to also go to the African Union and ask the African Union to encourage its member states to um, uh, contribute uh, forces to this proposed uh, Blue Helmet uh, election security force. Does the United States support this? The United States supports this entirely. And, and in fact, we've been working behind the scenes to try to encourage the government and the opposition to, to, to come to a, an agreement um, that would facilitate such an action and, and, and movement by the international community. We support it financially we, as well. Who do we think is the most influence over the regime in this case? Who would be the best interlocutor? Who? The oil companies. You? You're right, and I, I wanted to jump in with the United States, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, one is that we would reconsider military aid. Uh, if we saw a significant reversal on the part of, of, the, of the administration, we would be working uh, with... By the way, uh, the Nigerian government just made a dismissive gesture. I'm not, I'm not done. <laughs> I'm, I'm increasing the, uh, the incentives. The human rights uh, we'll be working with the four nations' uh, neighbors uh, as well. We will be uh, uh, inviting Ned uh, to try to encourage the National Endowment for Democracies to participate. 
we would pledge to them we would be working overtime to get the Gulf War states to not fund Boca Haram, and um, we would uh, um, put extreme pressure publicly on them if they choose not to. On the Nigerian government? Yep. Okay. Nigerian government. Wait, I want to hear from the oil company. You were a telecom company. You look like an oil company now. Yeah, as uh, internationally operating oil companies, we are completely uninterested in getting involved in the domestic politics in Nigeria and uh, want to remind you where the oil is in Nigeria. <laughs> I guess she told you. Now, and the Nigerian <laughs> government. <laughs> Go ahead. We're very willing to allow an election in northeastern Nigeria, there's two issues. One is the practical issue of, unfortunately, us not controlling 40 local government areas where we don't see how elections could be held unless Boko Haram plans to administer them, and I don't think they do. Beyond that, there's- And you don't think the United Nations suggestion of a blue helmet uh, force in the region to help with that is sufficient? Well, I would ask why the United Nations hasn't acted in the last four years to help Nigeria with Boko Haram, and why it's only for an election that they would muster blue helmets so that people can vote, but people have been dying for the last four years. Um, so the thing is, is that if everybody in these three states who could vote could vote for the opposition, President Jonathan would still win he'd be reelected. We have no problem with the elections being held there, except as it affects the safety and security of the public. Okay, yes. And, and I wanna encourage you, we've got four or five minutes here, I wanna encourage people who have solutions to reverse this situation to speak with solutions. Yes. Um, the international uh, NGOs would politely like to re request the international community to get a grip here. This is a train wreck waiting to happen, and there's no time to deploy a Chapter 6 peacekeeping uh, operation between now and the elections. Uh, the U.S., the EU, the African Union need to take a clear stand to the government of Nigeria that elections that exclude three states uh, is not uh, uh, possible, not legitimate. Uh, and a different solution needs to be found uh, to a transitional government of national unity until such time as all parts of the country can vote uh, and uh, participate in the election process. Pauline. The uh, Nigerian NGO community supports that, and further, in order to persuade the Nigerian government to cooperate on the UN plan, uh, if it rejects that, we will organize a nationwide free, fair, and safe campaign uh, in order to, even if it means postponing the election, in order to have a free, fair, and safe campaign. And we will blend that with the uh, opposition to the uh, ending of the oil subsidy so we get a national constituency here in favor of a free vote. Uh, yes, go ahead, Teresa. So um, just to remind the Nigerian government that they could have come to the Security Council at any time in the last couple of years um, to seek international uh, help or assistance in addressing its security situation. But the Nigerian government told everybody in the world that they had it, that they were good to go, that they didn't need any help, <laughs> that, that everybody <laughs> could just mind their own business, please, that they, they have the situation totally and completely under control. And oh, by the way, I think they have killed Shikau and Shikau's doubles. It's the first, you know, um, three or four times in the last oh, couple of years. So that's why the, the UN um, has not been previously involved. I have to say, you're being terribly an effective role player. <laughs> I don't believe the UN has been that effective recently as you have just been. Kim, yeah? Do you just want to ask a question? I don't know if... No, no, that is creative. No, no, that out of the box is you, UN action is out of the box. There's no question about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah uh, right. Can I actually ask a, a question? Did we hear a reaction from the Nigerian government on the proposal of a transitional uh, unity government? And, and what about uh, postponing the elections for a few months until things stabilize? Did we? Did we? Um, given that um, we believe the public would reelect, good luck, Jonathan. Uh, if 
if the proposal is for good luck Jonathan to lead a government of national unity, we'd be happy to consider that. How does the opposition feel about that? Well, uh, extension of uh, time for election uh, is not acceptable to the opposition, but uh, we can consider uh, interim government. If you have a sufficient role in that government. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For instance, uh, just about at the end of this okay. round. Okay. Well, I, I, look, I think the international community has to take a fairly strong and clear stand on this. As, as proposed, it really would call into credibility the, the outcome of the election. The Nigerian government should know this, and it will only deepen tensions in the country, perhaps produce more violence. There are examples of other countries that have faced this problem, Mali, Afghanistan, others, and found ways to have a national election. I think the answer to this, uh, I, I respectfully disagree with the UN proposal. I don't think it would come timely and I don't think it would be effective. But I do think that the parties should come together, the PDP, the opposition party, the Electoral Commission, and come up with ways, and that several have been proposed, that people can either vote or as IDPs vote, and make it possible to have a national election. If everybody agrees that that will take another couple of months, fine. But it can't be done unilaterally by the government because once again, it calls into credibility this election. And if the election isn't credible, then it has ramifications for Nigeria's relationships uh, throughout the world. Okay, thank you. I think what we've heard here are some interesting suggestions from the United Nations, from uh, uh, the NGOs in this regard, I think uh, also from the European Union there. Um, but let's for a moment move to the next slide and assume that those did not take hold, um, that they did not reverse the trend. Uh, and in the wake of the election, this is now after the election, it takes place, it doesn't take place in these three states. Marginalized Muslim youth in the north have grown increasingly violent sparking waves of Christian Muslim violence as well as violent protests by dissatisfied citizens decrying political corruption. Increasing interreligious violence has reached a tipping point, causing concern throughout the country, and violence has begun to spill across the borders. International actors are calling on Nigeria to confront broader questions of political marginalization. What we've done here is we've sort of taken this to the next step. You recall when you were voting, the vast majority of people felt that no matter what happens in the election, it's not going to resolve the political tensions in this country. Now, in the case of this scenario, you're going to have the election. There are going to be factors that call it into question, such as the uh, disenfranchising of these three states. Uh, and uh, so you're going to have an even more difficult situation than you would in a clear-cut, uh, transparent election. And that puts us in this situation where violence is beginning to spread. Why this in this scenario? Because we want to understand what the tipping point is for any kind of effective international action. Is there a tipping point? Is the spread of violence, is the risk of Nigeria really falling into some kind of chaos likely to produce new ideas from all of you, or is it not? So you've got five minutes, but I do want to finish strong and focus on new ideas for how do we address this. So, International governments may want to talk together, international NGOs and local NGOs may want to talk together. The opposition may want to talk to other governments. You know, figure out how you can solve this and we'll resume in five minutes.
We'll begin again in two minutes. Just two minutes and then we'll begin again. One minute, if everybody would start to resume their seats, that would be great. So we'll resume in one minute. Okay, why don't we all resume our seats and uh, the, resume the discussion. All right, one thing that was not anticipated on this slide, and should have been, is who won the election. Um, now, uh, you know, we sort of thought it was self-evident. If you want to say something, hit the button. <laughs> you want to say something? Okay, go on. I want to say something about your question with regards to who won the election. I think we have to go into this knowing that for a vast majority of Nigerians, the perception of who won or who lost is more important than who actually got the more votes. And what's going to trigger the violence is the perception that people have of the outcome and the process, or the process and the outcome, not necessarily the exact count that comes out of no, the Understood. Commission. But and, and in the context of the scenarios and, what, and shutting off voting in the three provinces, in the three states, and I, and I had a conversation with somebody who said that there's actually buzz going around now in Abuja that it might be six states, you know. So all, all, all you have to do is, in the context of that, and we assume that good luck Jonathan wins. Okay, we will assume that so for the purpose of this discussion. So how does the opposition feel about this? You may, either of you may speak as the opposition. But you must speak into the microphone when you speak. We were working from a different assumption. Well, I'm sorry. So, yeah. So we need to ad lib a little bit here. But um, let me talk about the solution we came up with. And that was okay. that we reached a point of agreement through some complicated negotiations with the ruling party that one very important practical change that could be made that would make a difference here would be to devolve the centralized police service and have a state level police service and by doing that um, we felt that the, there would be more of a chance for the police to be responsive to the violence on a local level and that would make a huge difference. Okay, there was an interesting comment. You made the comment to me earlier. Is there a microphone here? Somebody have a microphone? Could you bring it down here? I just want you to talk about that idea that okay, this is an economic idea and I just want to draw a connection between it and what you said here but go ahead you're, spe you're speaking loud but somehow the microphone is not picking it up here so
So for the last 20 years, the devolution of oil revenue from the federal to the state governments has provided the link that keeps them together. Now with the declining oil revenues available to states for their local expenditures, it may force some of the reformist governors to begin taxation at the local level of wealth there in order to provide services there because they cannot count on getting it, particularly in the next 12 months from the federal level because it's not going to be there, which may begin a process of restructuring uh, and creating more responsibility and authority at the state level and make it a real federal system. I just thought that was interesting in the context of what you're talking about, that since this election scenario is taking place in the context of falling oil prices and a budget crisis for the central government, and one possibility might be you devolve a little power down and you know, g give people the right to do some taxation, which could then support what you're talking about, I don't know, maybe the pieces fit together, that's all. Yes, I'm sure you're supporting what I say here, but I. So we had a couple of ideas. Um, one is that, you know, we thought about um, appointing somebody from the Northeast, the head of the military. So we thought that's important in terms of not just symbolism, but also in terms of talking about addressing some of the legitimate grievances um, that many of these youth do have. Um, the other thing we thought about doing is having Buhari lead as sort of a, a kind of a commission looking into national unity. So leading, and this is part of like, how do we can activate key influencers? So the religious leaders, um, those that are on the ground that have um, sort of credibility. Um, the other thing was looking at state police. So instead of having federal police, have state police overseeing this, and I think that's important. Um, and the other thing, too, that's, that's your idea. Yeah, well. that's their ideas. We, agree. we agreed on that. Um, and then also, we, you know, with a tip to hat to our U.S. colleagues, we learned a lot about what not to do in Ferguson. So we thought about how do we apply some of those lessons here in Nigeria about what not to do. And um, so we thought about it's easy to know what you're against. It was, it was, like I said, it's easy to know what you're against, but what are you for? Right, you have to present an alternative. I just, I just want to understand here. So what you're saying is that you don't want Nigeria to descend to the level of Missouri. That's right. Okay. And so, so what we, we thought about actually is, what's the one thing, and we all know this, us Nigerians, what's the one thing that, com that youth get excited about in Nigeria? And what happens to be about th this time of year in just, February? It's just, the African just, Cup of Nations. Justin Bieber, oh. It's the Flying Eagles. The Nigerian football team, one Nigeria, one team. We launch a whole campaign about youth getting involved um, at the local level with, you know, sort of things that they know they're for. That's the Isn't one thing the they listen to. Isn't the African Cup postponed? Isn't it postponed because it's, of? You it's know, not postponed. It's still going on Where's in February it be next year. So the but the point yeah. is that we need to come up with narratives about what youth are for, addressing those grievances. So you provide those alternatives in terms of something that's sort of more positive alternative narratives as opposed to anti-Boko Haram, anti-this. How are you guys responding to all this? Well, we see the widespread outbreak of religiously motivated violence as a major opportunity. It gives us the opportunity to expel the remaining Christian population in the territories that we control. It also enables us to present ourselves as the champions of Muslims in areas where there is active Christian uh, Muslim um, fighting. This could be for us an extremely important turning point if in response to widespread violence in Nigeria there was some kind of outside inter, uh, uh, intervention, be it by the UN or be it something similar to what the French did in Mali. Were that to happen, we would likely seek to integrate ourselves more into the international jihadist movement that would tend to change our character, and it would also make us a direct threat to US national security 
something which we have not been up to now. Okay, so we have a response from the Nigerian government. We see how Boko Haram is likely to respond in this particular sense. The, the states in northern Nigeria, how are you responding to this? And then I want to turn to the international community and say, what are your creative solutions about responding to this? Is it supporting them? Is it responding directly to them? Is there something else that can be done? Yeah. First, we have to remind the federal government that the head of the military is already from the Northeast uh, states. Uh, and as to I think, their I think they knew that. They, were, uh, they just were forgot it. He's Christian. Uh, uh, the Flying Eagles um, is sometimes, soccer is war by other means, uh, if you think that's going to hold the thing together. Um, but uh, we do agree with, uh, uh, with our APC uh, federal colleagues here on the devolution of, uh, of police uh, to state. I think that would be, uh, the, regardless of the crisis, that would be a step in the, in the right direction. You cannot have a federation with no state and local police, in, in case someone didn't read the script on, on that. Uh, we do think, as thirdly, there should be a last-ditch effort of getting religious leaders on both sides to talk uh, credible leaders. There is an interfaith initiative for peace at the senior level. It's, it could be spread out uh, to the state level uh, as well. And to really get this uh, interfaith uh, cooperation, leadership by example, uh, front and center, and, and they would they, whatever residual authority they have. Finally, the scenario that's been presented to us leaves us no choice but to say the military has to step in. Uh, not as a coup, but as a stabilization program uh, uh, on the doctrine of necessity. These are doctrines that our friends have invented when it, when it uh, suits them. Uh, this would prevent the breaking up of the country because we're now talking about something that would split the country, and we in the North don't believe in that. Okay, yeah, Pauline, and then I, what I'd really like to hear, we've got uh, 15 minutes left of this, is the best solutions that we can find from the international community or otherwise to deal with the situation that has now deteriorated to an extreme level, yes. Uh, in many previous crises, and once it didn't work and the country fell apart, but they talk about the muddle through solution where when elected leaders or established leaders can't get through, other prominent elders step, to get, step in and try to negotiate an outcome. Uh, this could be done if you had that leadership representing both religious leaders and other elders representing the various ethnic and geographical areas with a view toward coming to some sort of new dispossession, dispossession, dispossession which is what the South Africans would say. One of the so possible solutions, instead of a government of national unity, which I think would be uh, unlikely to happen, and is a kind of Afghan outcome where you have a president and what's Abdallah, Abdallah, the executive head of a government. So it's a kind of unity government, but you still have the president saying, I won the election, but we're going to include the opposition in a kind of a structure that still is left to be negotiated. And these elders could work that out as a kind of executive committee. It's a long shot. The international community could support it. It has to be an internal solution, however. I think the external uh, community can only be a supporter. I don't think there's a, you know, a knight that's going to come in and say, okay, this is the way it's going to be handled. But that could be an outcome. There are a lot of people in Nigeria who are kingmakers that could come together and cross those, those boundaries if, in fact, there was a solution that pointed to inclusion, political inclusion, not just economic inclusion. So you think that one thing this might do is stimulate real political change well, yeah, and well, perhaps churn up some new leaders? Pulling back from the brink. Now, whether or not that means it's going to be a permanent solution or lead to a new constitutional formula, but to pull back from the brink, because I think one thing that a lot of Nigerians don't want is another civil war. And I think if you had military intervention, that could quickly then descend into a civil war. <coughs> Okay, other, oh, all right, sure, Deirdre. Well, the local business community and the multinational corporations met together, and um, we thought that under the circumstances, uh, given that uh, the reputation of the country 
would be so damaged that uh, international investment would be come to a halt, that it was absolutely critical that the business community become involved in some kind of solution. And so one could be that the um, uh, National Chamber of Commerce based in Lagos could begin uh, behind the scenes to uh, start discussions uh, with uh, perhaps the international community and also with the governors and other po political leaders of the country to explain that um, it was important for uh, peace to be reestablished. And then a committee uh, of senior uh, government, uh, religious, and business uh, persons and personalities, very well respected, uh, a small group could then form a delegation and visit each one of these states, hold <laughs> negotiations, mediate between these two groups, and um, propose a, a peaceful solution. Uh, if that is agreed, then the carrot can, can be held out would be that these uh, work programs that had been discussed earlier could then be kick-started, and uh, a large number of youth particularly could become employed or trained very quickly in the aftermath. What about other kinds of political solutions that have taken place in other kinds of countries? In some cases you've had popular uprisings from, you know, at the street level uh, that might be triggered by, you know, new technologies or new media. Uh, in, in other cases you've had extremist groups that have been co-opted by being invited into the government or you give certain people within the extremist groups um, an opportunity to play a role, and thus you turn the parts of the extremist group against one another. Um, I, I'm just, again, I'm throwing this out as to say, are, are there gr other possibilities that may make some sense here? Go ahead. Um, there's been a fairly uh, um, reported recently example that uh, Colombia has done with the advertising campaigns against the FARC rebels and the work they did. If Christmas can come to the jungle, you can come home, and they used in the World Cup. And they did some very interesting stuff. But then again, that was only possible after there was a view that the Colombia government is a viable leader that is inclusive, that will take everybody and put FARC in that corner. As long as there is no united government, all of these ideas of breaking the opposition or trying to go into these young people who are being recruited by Boko Haram or other groups that are being activists are not going to bear fruit unless there is that unity. So really, it, it's, it's difficult to be, not to be boring and to be repetitive, but there has to be leadership. After that leadership, there's a whole host of ideas on traditional and social media, tech. There's a whole host of people that you can bring in and be like, all right, I have leadership. Let's do some stuff and let's try to get these guys out of the streets. But until that exists, it's very difficult for people to find a reason to get out of the street. There is nothing else for them. They have to take ownership because the people in the South are not doing anything. Go. Um, yeah, and I think just building on what Michelle said, there's kind of two phases to this. One is kind of creating that framework for some type of unified government to kind of assume the vacuum that's being created here. And then there's almost a healing process that needs to happen you know, when we're talking about the elders going, yes, on media, going into the villages, but that has to be on the back of some type of like solution like was in Kenya or in Afghanistan, where the two kind of leaders at the top come to some type of alignment. Otherwise, these campaigns are, you know, going on to a situation that's continuing to be inflamed because of those differences. Do the experts here have recommendations for this group? For recommendations for how you deal with a situation like this? Pages from the USIP book, other kinds of ideas to to suggest ideas that are out of the box? I have some thoughts, but I, I'm going to reserve them until after this because they actually sort of... For the last for, session. For the last session, right, indeed. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> They're State Department. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, that's the State Department for you. No, after you. Please, no, you speak first. No, 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 go. I mean, I, I, have a, I have more of a question um, outside the role of the U.S. government. I think because we're assuming that the recommendations that were put on the table in advance of the elections were rejected, right, the, the monitors and the international assistance and everything else was rejected, the international community now feels, uh, would feel like you got what you asked for, 
Um, so it becomes incumbent upon the government, which is delegitimized, which may have been legitimized had the elections been monitored and, and blessed. Um, and so it's hard, to, it's hard to see through this yeah, but, move but wait in a the second. game. Can the, does the international community have the luxury of saying you're on your own in the largest economy in the region, the largest country in the region, in a place where Boko Haram could at any moment sign up to be part of the, the, you know, the, the global franchise of the month, whatever that is, in terms of you know, global jihadism, where violence um, can spread, where it can impact global oil markets, where it can impact neighboring countries. I mean, does the international community really have the ability to shrug its shoulders in a situation like this? Yeah, go on. No. I won't uh, reserve comments until the last session. <laughs> Thank um, you. That's leadership. <laughs> Were you, yeah. Did you actually work in the State Department? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's right. Mostly, <laughs> as, <laughs> mostly as a renegade, David. Okay. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say that uh, absolutely not. Uh, obviously, uh, ownership and resolution uh, of this problem uh, must reside first uh, and foremost uh, with, uh, with uh, Nigerians, uh, and coming out of it must be uh, largely a Nigerian solution. Uh, but given the kind of issues that would arise from a collapse of a Nigerian state, uh, the international community has a important role to play to prevent th that from creating uh, destabilization uh, in Cameroon, uh, in Chad, Niger, uh, Benin, uh, and, uh, and, and Togo, because the collapse of a uh, Nigerian state would uh, send an enormous number of refugees uh, across the border, uh, would require enormous uh, amounts of uh, international assistance, uh, humanitarian assistance to deal with both people fleeing uh, and also uh, it, it displaced uh, persons. Uh, it also would give an opportunity for uh, Boko Haram to flex its muscles even further uh, in a chaotic situation, uh, which would uh, require uh, some degree of, uh, of, of, of political uncertainty spreading uh, further afield. So the international community uh, does have a, a, a role to play. And I think uh, in this kind of a situation, uh, I think you turn uh, to a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of African wise men, uh, starting uh, with individuals like uh, Kofi Annan uh, and a group of uh, other respected uh, former uh, African uh, presidents who would probably lead a uh, procession uh, of visits to that country to bring together both the government uh, and the opposition. Uh, their efforts would be followed up uh, by high-level uh, calls, uh, approaches from uh, Western and African uh, heads of state, uh, followed up by visits of uh, both uh, secretaries uh, of states and foreign ministers uh, into, the, into, the, uh, into the breach. Uh, the one thing that we do not, uh, none of us want to see happen uh, is a uh, collapse uh, of the Nigerian state uh, or the return uh, to another civil war situation or the breakup of, uh, of, of Nigeria. It's important to remember that as bad uh, as Boko Haram is today, uh, across northern uh, Nigeria, where we have seen since uh, 2009 some four to 5,000 uh, people uh, uh, killed uh, since the uh, death of Muhammad Youssef. If you look back uh, to the uh, Nigerian Civil War uh, between 1967 and 1970, uh, we uh, were probably uh, witnessing an average of uh, five uh, to uh, 6,000 uh, people being uh, killed uh, almost uh, every week uh, for three years uh, in what turned out to be 
uh, an enormously bloody and nasty conflict. Uh, it, it took uh, uh, the Nigerians a long time of, uh, to, to resolve this, but I think that uh, it, we cannot afford to uh, allow uh, the uh, sixth largest Muslim state uh, in the world uh, to collapse in front of us. Okay. Um, I, I see a, a, a bunch of, I see, I see six hands, and, and we've got six minutes, oddly enough. Uh, if you guys can do the math. I can go quick. Okay, well, you're gonna go, okay, you go quick, then I'll go to I, I, I think it's almost an unfair response to, to take the comment, you're on your own. The United States is not going to be with someone if they have no sense of the consequence and we're stuck with them no matter what the hell they do. So we say to a government, you're on your own, we want a reaction. If they say, gosh, we kind of blew it a little, can you help us out? If they say, screw you, we're going to do whatever the hell we want, then that tells us that we have to be incredibly careful with how we deal with them. We're going to deal with the neighboring states. We're going to deal with Europe. But it's an attempt to, to understand what their response is. You didn't tell us what their response is. I would think that they're in a crisis. The European, my European colleague pointed quickly to me and said, crisis are opportunities. And it may be they want to back off and okay. you're on your own might let us know that's what they want to do. Okay, okay. Um, Kate. Uh, I think we should uh, see what the youth of Nigeria uh, are interested in for the future of their country. And they're not just part of the problem, they're also part of the solution. And uh, peer voices we know are most credible oftentimes uh, in counteracting you know, not just narratives, but also uh, pulling back from violence. So youth can be mobilized in Nigeria uh, to pull their counter their peers uh, back from the, this situation of political violence and to be voices for you know, the Nigeria that they want to see going forward. And we should okay, think a lot more how reach, to mobilize Reach out to you, Leanne. What was kind of surprising to me as Boko Haram the entire time was how few folks around the table came to talk to us. And the truth is, we were five at one point, and we did not always agree on everything internally. And there was no attempt made to factionalize us, to pull us away from each other. Good point. And the, you know, some of us have different motivations. If the international Good community point. consistently views everyone as monolithic and for, you know, uh, mostly for inchoate crimes, um, and then we're immediately off the table and nobody's going to talk. Uh, you're going to continue to see us get closer and closer together, even when we did have internal disagreements. Yeah, I totally agree. I brought it up, brought it up earlier. Agree with, totally with Chris. And, you know, this is part of what thinking outside the box is. You know, this is, this is what's called for in these kind of situations. Are there people you can peel away? Are there ways you can put wedge issues in? Are there ways you can turn groups that would... Well... The United States is not technically allowed to talk to them, but there are a lot of people we're not technically allowed to talk to that we talk to, you know? I mean, Iran is our sworn enemy, and they're certainly not our ally, and I, there's no way we're coordinating with them in Iraq. It's just not possible. <laughs> the, absolutely. Um, Princeton, and then Peter, and then we're going to be almost done here. Okay, okay then I'll go to you. Um, um, one of the problems with this scenario has been that we assume that Boko Haram is, an, is considered a national crisis for Nigerians. It is not. You can go around parts of Nigeria where they say, yeah, that's a problem in the north. But when you get to scenario three, when the country starts to uh, really implode, then it becomes perhaps a national crisis, and that allows for serious thinking on the Nigerians' part. I think Johnny's come up with a number of things. Uh, with African leadership. There is a vehicle in Nigeria, should they want to use it, the Council of States, which includes all former heads of state, the president, Supreme Court justices, etc. If they wanted to use that vehicle to say, let's come together and figure out how we get out of this. Then beyond that, if nothing is happening internally or alone, the, the outside community could convene leaders from Nigeria. Look the way the French convened the neighbors around Boko Haram. So you could get the OIC and the EU and the AU together to bring them outside of Nigeria. So in a number of ways to say, look, now that this crisis has developed, can we all help you and encourage you to find a way out of it 
with whatever mechanisms you decide, whether you use a council, whether you emer go toward a government of national unity, but we've been telling you you're on this train wreck, now you've got there, now how can we help you get out of it? Okay, very quickly, Peter, and then to here, and then we're gonna wrap up the session. So, okay. 60 seconds, Max. Okay. Uh, as President, it's been um, fun playing Boko Haram. Stepping out away from that, two quick suggestions for practical solutions. One is we need to craft solutions that can be implemented. This is a crisis that's immediate. It's now solutions that take years or even a crop cycle aren't going to do it. We need things that can be implemented very, very rapidly. Second point, uh, agreed with Ambassador Carson on the need and the responsibility of the international community. One thing that's been very effective, as you know, in Africa has been, it's never been attempted on the scale of a country like Nigeria, but having someone have ownership, because it's fine to have a procession of dignitaries and wise men through, but it takes one person, one point of contact, who speaks for the international community and has the strategic patience to, to negotiate all the long days and hours and weeks and months, and that needs to be attempted. We have to find the eminent, per eminent person to do it, and then uh, all get behind that one process. Last comment. Uh, <clears throat> this is indeed a regional crisis for all the neighboring states. Uh, there will be massive refugee flows uh, out of Nigeria. Uh, you could well have Boko Haram members uh, embedded in those refugees, which would give them a chance to begin operations outside of Nigeria. Um, in thinking this through, we didn't see really any way to get through this and get Nigeria back from the brink without a major realignment of leadership in Nigeria, and that's going to require convincing good luck Jonathan that he has to accept some changes. So I think the idea of the wise men and, and others uh, working on this is something that's uh, it's urgent and needs to be done right away. And it's also, this might be the stage, and we mentioned this earlier, that maybe some of the neighboring states want to begin direct talks with Boko Haram. Okay. Very, very useful. We um, have just completed the last phase of this uh, political scenario. What uh, the, the agenda calls for following a brief break is for us all to get back together and to try to draw some conclusions. To try to draw some conclusions about countering extremism uh, drawn from the experience we have in Nigeria. Uh, not just specifically about Nigeria, but worldwide. What kind of initiatives, be they economic or political, based on some of the conversations do we think would work. Um, this is a moment where thinking outside the box is really the subject of the conversation. And so I really, I, you've got 15 minutes to go and, and take a break. I really would like to encourage you to perhaps talk to the other members of your group, but try to come up with one or two things that you have drawn from this that are important lessons regarding combating uh, extremism worldwide, uh, or if you have some new idea about Nigeria you want to throw in there, please do that. If you want to pass because you don't have an idea, that's fine. I want to stick to people who have concrete, significant new ideas. I want us to you know, sort of end where we're supposed to, which is drawing conclusions from all of this that may be useful to people thinking about it here around the world, may be ideas that can lead to programs, uh, here or elsewhere. So take the 15 minutes. We'll see you back here at 4.15. Thank you very much.